Okay, let's go ahead and read our verse together today. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And here's the Pray for me in these next few weeks and obviously pray for each other because I think this is, I, I want to let you know right up front, um, I, I'm not going to show you any graphic videos or pictures and things like that. I don't think that's appropriate. That's not the style I use, nor I think the style we should use. Okay? Uh, though, feel free to do that. I, I have. I've, I've watched the portion videos. I've made myself available. I've made myself understand what's going on and what's happening. And I think you should too, but I'm not going to do that here in Sunday school this morning. And I'm talking about the issue of, of these moral issues and the church. Uh, because let me just say, uh, George Barna, who does a lot of research, wrote, wrote a recent book on millennials, uh, the Gen Zers, and what we're finding out is, the bottom line is, is that parents, okay, grandparents and parents are not having discussions with their children regarding faith integration, with worldview integration in the masses, okay? I think what ends up happening is a lot of times parents will default to just survival mode. I just want to get through the teen years. I, I want to go through this whole process of, you know, fight my battles, you know, and we're not going to sing uh, Michael W. Smith's This Is How I Fight My Battle, but this is what the, the home is all about. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times today we kind of pick and choose our battles. And we don't really even get into really the heart of the matter, the meat of the issues. And I think that's, we need to have those kind of discussions. But I also think we have to earn the right to have those types of discussions. What I mean by that is this. Uh, if, if, when our children ask us questions, we can't handle their questions. Uh, if they ask us questions about faith and we freak out because they accepted Jesus when they were five and they shouldn't be asking those type of questions as a 14 year old, we've got a real problem as a parent. Because they're going to have legitimate questions. And they're going to be hearing messages from a lot of different variety of sources, more so than they'll ever listen typically to your conversations. They're going to look at podcasts, they're going to be looking at YouTube, they're going to be looking at, 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 at listening to other people's opinions and viewpoints, their friends. And we need to have the church, the body of Christ, grandparents, parents, siblings, friends, the church, us, need to have conversations. And we need to be addressing moral issues that are impacting our world. Otherwise, as we know as a society, we've already talked about this is a post-Christian America. Now let that sink in. In other words... We're not, when people think of America, they're not necessarily thinking, oh, this is a Christian nation. We're in a post-Christian era. These, these are the moral issues that people are just kind of put off to the side because the church hasn't been relevant. We're answering questions nobody's asking. And we need to start dealing with those issues that are impacting our world today. So in your notes that you'll see, if you don't have notes, uh, did, was that already passed out? Already done? They're gone. Okay. A portion of the church. Proverbs 31, 8, 9. Someone read that for me real quick. Speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. Speak out in order to judge the righteousness and to defend the needy and the true. Well, this is the NIV translation in case you're wondering, which translation is this? Um, I typically use that unless I choose one that's better, a better translation. But I want you to see some things here. We are talking about an issue of speaking out for those who can't speak for themselves and the rights of all who are vulnerable. And you see the, this five-letter word here in the, the sixth letter, uh, word in the third sentence? Judge. Right, on the count of three, I would just say judge. One, two, three. Judge. Wait. Judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> what are we talking about? The context, folks. That passage of scripture is dealing with judging someone's motives, not judging someone's actions. Paul, I, I'm not here to judge the world. I'm, just, I'm here to judge the church. We need to judge each other on these issues. And let me just say this. I want to make sure everyone understands this, and I'll try to remember to say this every single week. 
Um, and I'm not saying this because Tom does because I shared it, but I do this at the end of every class. I love you. And the reason I'm doing this series is because I love you. And please do not, throughout this series, think that there's any condemnation. Okay? We don't condemn. We don't put down someone for their choices. You may have been in here. You're in here today, and you've had an abortion. You paid someone to have an abortion. And I want to tell you, the forgiveness of God is there for you. In every one of these topics, there is no such thing as God won't forgive that other than the unpardonable sin, and this isn't it. Okay? So understand my heart in all of these topics. But God has called us to speak out for the voiceless. And that includes the unborn, the elderly, the infirmed, those who are incapable of speaking for themselves because they're incapable of doing so at that time. But in your hearts, 1 Peter 3, 15 says, you've heard me say this multiple times, you probably hear me use this verse multiple times again. Because I think if there's a life verse that I want to have for my life, it's this one. But in your heart, so what he's asking you in your heart, in your life, it's the seat of your emotions, your will, your decision making. It's revere or set apart Christ, worship Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Valuing every human being because they were created in the image of God. Everyone. But we need to be prepared. We need to be knowledgeable enough to be able to have a decent conversation regardless of what the issue is. But I'm not an expert in that. God didn't call us to be experts, but he did say that we need to learn and study. Revere means to worship Christ as Lord. The question that we have to ask all of ourselves, including me, and believe me, I preach myself every single lesson. Who's your Lord, Lou? Are you the Lord? For those of us who grew up in the day of the, the earlier years of liberty, who's in the driver's seat? Some of used to ask us. Are you in the driver's seat or is the Holy Spirit in the driver's seat? Who's running your life? God and his word or yourself? He says, always be prepared. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's King James translation because I memorized almost everything in King James. Sorry, I didn't memorize it in the IV. I just prefer that translation. God will give us opportunities to share our beliefs. The question is, though, will we be ready? Do we even care to be ready? Well, that's not my gift. What? Sharing? Okay. No, we need to be ready to share. What would it be like if you put yourself in a situation where you were here at Thomas Road Baptist Church and you decided to work in ministry and you're volunteering with the middle school and high school department and you, you love on those kids, you talk to those kids and one of them comes up to you and pulls on your shirt and says, can I talk to you for a second? And they look at you in the face and they start to cry, and they go, I'm pregnant. I'm scared out of my mind that I just found out. I can't tell my parents they would kill me. I'm thinking about having an abortion. What would you do? What would you say? I don't know. <laughs> you know? We, we, can, we, can, we can say a lot of wonderful things. But let me just make this comment. There's a lot of parents, kids whose parents, they think their, their parents would kill them. And you may feel like it. But of course we wouldn't. But they don't know that. Let me tell you something. The greatest gift you can give your child is the affirmation that you always love them. No matter what. You will love them no matter what. And they can always come to you and tell you anything. And you're there to support them and help them. But let me tell you, folks, it's not in every home. 
I've been, I, you know I've been teaching liberty a long time and I've been talking about this subject. This is my 35th year of doing it. And I've had girls walk up to me after class and they said, my daddy said I have to have an abortion because he's the pastor of a church and he doesn't want to be embarrassed in his congregation with a girl who's gotten pregnant out of wedlock. What do I do? So you've got some struggles in the church. When a, a pastor's daughter is pregnant out of wedlock and the, her father wants the abortion and said, I'm paying for it because I don't want you to be embarrassed with our family. These kids are going through all kinds of things. How many of you ever made a decision in your life that you were embarrassed by that you didn't want to tell your parents? Does is anybody? I did. Anybody else? Okay. But what is the Christian home like today? We have to give an answer to everyone, including our children. For hope, not condemnation. Hope. We're living in, I asked the question, but I think it's rhetorical. We're living in a cynical world today. Where people don't think the church has the answer, they just have condemnation. They know if you love God, God can use any circumstance, any circumstance for his good. He didn't cause that child to be born. He didn't cause that couple to fall into sin or choose this or incest to occur or evil to occur to create that. He's created a life and it's precious. And we say he has a wonderful plan for your life. Yes, he does. And let's not end it from beginning to end for any reason of our own volition. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like a set of new glasses that helps us see the world with greater clarity, the value of human life defines how we see and respond to those around us. From the formation of a child's first tiny self to life's final breath, all life has dignity and value. Because each and every one of us is made in the image of God. And that is why, when we talk about being pro-life, it's not just about a political issue. It's a worldview. It's a life view. It's a way of looking at each human life that transcends culture, class, race, age, and opinion. Knowing that we are all uniquely created in the image of God. The sanctity of human life is deeply rooted in scripture and modeled through the life of Jesus Christ who said, Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. When we begin to see others as God sees them, we're moved to care more deeply about those created in His image. And we will live each day in a way that honors our Creator. We won't see the scriptures as mere words, but as commands to express His heart through our actions. Commands like speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And ensure justice for those being crushed. Or love your neighbor as yourself. The sanctity of human life speaks to ancient questions that span all of time and every culture. Questions like, who is God? Who am I? Who is my neighbor? Jesus responded to those questions with the story of the Good Samaritan, who saw another man who was broken and bleeding. And instead of looking the other way as others had, he stopped and cared for that man, even at great cost to himself. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Let us see people as God sees them seeing their needs, and having mercy on them, because every person is made in the image of God. Don't be silent in the face of injustice, but be a voice for those who cannot speak for themselves. May we not pass judgment on the woman facing an unexpected pregnancy, but surround her with support, helping her to see the child growing within her as a unique person, with a life as valuable as her own. So, reach out to orphans in distant lands, 
support the foster child in our own backyard. Who is waiting, hoping, and praying for a family to call their own. Embrace those with special needs as a special reflection of the image of our Creator God. Let us care for the widow in distress and loneliness. And let us befriend those in prison. Let us shine a light on practices that distort human dignity. Like human trafficking and the cycle of poverty that limits God-given potential and dreams. Make sacrifices to meet the needs of those dying preventable deaths because they lack food, medicine, and clean water. Let us rejoice in the image of God as expressed through various skin colors and ethnic traditions. Refusing to tolerate racist attitudes and mock the one that created us. Let us choose to see those who disagree with us as God sees them, treating them with respect and dignity. While helping them to open their eyes to see the beauty and value of life. That is what it means to be pro-life. This is why we need to be a voice. The number of abortions in the U.S., you can read it, dropped finally under a million for the first time in 2013. 14, but there's many reasons for this. Fewer doctors are performing abortions today, praise the Lord. Fewer facilities are available, praise the Lord. But the one I'm concerned most about in this number is Plan B. It's, it's um, a method that's designed to, to end the pregnancy after conception. And um, these are gut-wrenching decisions. Uh, it's convenient. It's inexpensive. Um, and you also, I, I, I give my phone numbers, many of you know, to my students every year. A couple years ago, I had a girl call me on the phone, and, she's, and it was late at night. Um, and she said, I'm a student in your class, and I was committed to purity. I had been involved in many relationships back home. It was wrong, it was sinful, and I knew that I shouldn't when I got to Liberty, and then I met a guy in town, and I'm pregnant. I already, this was when Plan B had two steps to it. Now it's just one. She said, I've taken the first step. What should I do? Now legally, I have some responsibility at that point of what I tell her. I said, now, you tell me, what have you heard in class? And she articulated the biblical worldview response to it. She said, but I'm scared. I said, I understand that, but let me tell you, you've got a church, you've got a school, you've got people that love you and will help you through this. I got a phone call from her. About seven days later, she said, Dr. Weider, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't take the risk. I took plan B part two. I just wanted it over. And I thought I'd let you know. There's a lot of fear with pregnancy when you're single. There's a lot of fear in regards to a lot of things in life, but it's still one of the most common surgical procedures in the United States. It used to be the number one surgical procedure in the U.S. You can see these statistics. You've already read them. But I, I think it's interesting. I want to let you know this is an old, old statistic. It's 15 years old. Okay? Why? <laughs> because they didn't get the results they were hoping for. This AGI is the Alan Guttmacher Institute. He's got great research. He's not a Christian. It's liberal. But they tell typically as it is in most cases. Why? 21% said that inad inadequate finances or 21% not ready for the responsibility. 16% of women's life would be changed too much. 12% problems with the relationship are unmarried. Too young, not mature enough. Children are grown. Woman has all, all the children she wants. Fetus has possible health problems, but they don't know, right? I had students this week tell me that that was them, and they were perfectly fine, obviously. The, the study and the, and the research isn't accurate all, all the time, okay? But it's a fear. 
Woman has health problems, pregnancy caused by rape or incest. 1%. Okay? That's a misnomer. A lot of people, uh, look at all the people who are having abortions that were raped. You, you know, it's, it's 1%. Okay? This is my definition. This is not the medical definition. Med abortion is the deliberate termination of a human being from the moment of conception until just prior to birth. Okay? The reason why it's my definition is because abortion, okay, listen, this is very important to understand. Abortion medically does not occur, okay, until after implantation of a fertilized egg. Okay? That's why they say plan B which stops the implantation of a fertilized egg, isn't abortive. Because they, they designed the definition of abortion to not call it after conception, but only after implantation. Okay? I do this, I'm gonna do this quickly, but I think it's important that you understand something. Um, if you went to law school, one of the things that you'd be doing a lot in law school is memorizing legal cases. The reason for that is because it's called legal precedence. As a, as a lawyer, as a judge, you've got to look at cases that historically have taken place in the past, which will give you content and necessary information for the current cases that they're experiencing. Okay? And today, the number one case that's in many cases, not just the abortion issue, but multiple cases today, is Griswold versus Connecticut. Griswold was a Planned Parenthood director. And a married couple came to them, came to him, Griswold, and said, we would like information about uh, contraception. Okay, now think about this. Look at the date, 1965. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> 1965, it was illegal to talk to a married couple about contraception. You couldn't get it openly. You could go to a pharmacy and get it behind the counter, but it was a private issue. The only person you could talk to about it was your family physician. He was, they found out that he, as a Planned Parenthood director, he was counseling couples, he was arrested. He went to the United States Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled in Griswold versus Connecticut that the United States Constitution provides all of its citizens with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And married couples should have the right to privacy in that marital relation. Whether they do who do not conceive is up to them. And if they can get advice, get it wherever you can. Eisenstock versus Barrett. William Barrett was a professor in, in Boston. <coughs> 1972, seven years later almost. William Barrett's teaching in class. He's lecturing to students about ethics and morals. And he holds up a box of contraceptives. It was a foam used to kill the sperm. And in this box, he's talking about it, what it is and how it's used. A single girl walked up to him after the lecture and said, are you using that box for anybody else or any other lectures? He goes, no, I just bought it for the lecture. She goes, can I have it? He goes, sure, I don't care. Students saw it and he was arrested. It went to the Supreme Court. William Barron fought court against Eisenstadt, who was, who was speaking for the state of Massachusetts, highly Catholic, conservative in this area, pro-life, and they said, William Baird, we may, we may understand that we think it's morally wrong for young people to be doing that. But Griswold already showed that every individual has the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and the right to privacy regarding relations. 
and it doesn't de designate the difference between a married person and a single person. We're throwing this case out because it was already decided in Griswold, the right to privacy. And that issue is going across the board in the issue of homosexuality and other things in the United States today. It's Griswold that they go back to. Roe versus Wade. Jane Roe, Norma McCorvey, was pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy. So she went to Planned Parenthood and she agreed to be their poster child for this court case. What she later declared was that she had no clue how long it took her to go to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, her case went to the Supreme Court, but she had already had her baby before this court even ruled. And in a 7-2 decision, because of Griswold versus Connecticut and Eisenstadt versus Baird, and the Constitution itself, the right to privacy was already established, should I or shouldn't I have a baby? And the bottom line became, you have the choice. If you don't want this baby, you don't have to, because the Constitution does not define the unborn as persons. It lifted all bans on abortion in all 50 states. A woman's right to privacy extends to her liberty to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. That's what the United States Supreme Court decided on that day. Now, it obviously was a, a major Supreme Court, but the actual... Texan ruler who was fighting for the pro-life movement was very um, um, inept and did not do well. But nevertheless, because of their knowledge of fetology and a lot of things, here's an example. They came up with three trimesters. Do they have any idea what happened in the trimester? Not really. These nine justices came to the conclusion men Typically, we're not even allowed in today. You have to go if you're a man or your wife will strangle you. You will be there and you will, you know, you'll do all those things with her. Okay? Breathe. You did this to me. Okay. You gotta be there. They were, they were pacing back and forth in a waiting room, right? Waiting for what happened. They took the nine month pregnancy. They didn't call it 40 weeks. They called it nine months. Three, 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 nine. Good, we're good to go. Did they understand what took place? That the heart was beating? That, that the child feels pain in the first? No, they didn't have a clue. Okay. The Supreme Court declared that the Constitution does not define person. Okay? Person has application only after birth, most namely. Person as used in the 14th minute does not include the unborn. See? No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 14th Amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the jurisdiction thereof, our citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It does not include the unborn. So the United States Supreme Court at this point said, the Constitution and its amendments do not define the unborn as persons, and so we're going to declare them not to be persons. And they piggybacked intentionally another court case. Everybody knows Roe v. Wade. Everybody, how many of you have ever heard of Roe v. Wade? Raise your hand. If you, if you have, it's before today. Okay? How many of you have heard, other than those of my students, and I hope you will raise your hand, and if you don't remember, still raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you have heard of Doe versus Bolton? <clears throat> Roe v. Wade covered the first trimester primarily. No restrictions. Doe versus Bolton actually has actually more implications than Roe v. Wade does. And it's still being used today across the board. A mentally challenged woman was brought before the court. She was not pregnant. They called her Jane Doe. Okay? 
What if they asked the question, what if she became pregnant but didn't know until the second or third trimester? Should have been a question mark there, sorry. Because of her mental state, shouldn't she have the option of an abortion? What if she doesn't know she's pregnant? Do we want these types of individuals reproducing in our culture today? That's why across the river, they sterilized human beings during this time. No. And so they defined the health of the mother to include familial, financial, psychological well-being as determined by her physician. I didn't take the time to put up the, the justice's comments on this I, for time's sake here today, but the bottom line became, hey, it's all open. It, it doesn't matter what it is. If she doesn't want the discomforts of pregnancy, hello, that through the day before the child's born, she can get a court ruling to have it aborted because of that. Oh, I guess I can. Childbirth may deprive a woman of her preferred lifestyle and force upon her a radically different and undesired future. For example, to endure the discomforts of pregnancy, to incur the pain and higher mortality rate, the, and after effects of childbirth, to abandon educational plans, to sustain loss of income, to forego the satisfactions of careers, to tax further mental and physical health, and providing childcare, and in some cases, oh boy, have we come a long way, to bear the lifelong stigma of unwed motherhood. Stigma. Today it's celebrated. Yeah, here. Yeah, exactly the same exact logic. I'm not going to get specific, but I want you to at least know what's legal in the United States. Okay? If your constitution does not provide you the ability to hear anything related to this, close your ears and pray about it. <laughs> IUDs, interuterine devices. Okay? This always is caused, it inflames the uterine wall and 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 uh, Diminishes the uh, coating around the outside of the fertilized egg so it doesn't implant. So it always causes the lack of implantation of a fertilized egg. In my definition, that's an abortion. They're aborting what potentially could happen. Now, I will be fair. You need to be aware of this. A young couple decides to get married. They get married, they're, they just want to have kids right away. We'll just say it that way, okay? 25% of fertilized eggs in those relationships pass through the menstrual cycle and are not in play. Well, what does God do with that? Let God be God and I'll be Lou. I don't have to. Is there an incubator? Are there wombs in heaven? Do they go, Pff! what happened? All I know is I was swimming upstream, I hit something and I'm here. <laughs> I don't. The, is, when the Bible is silent, we stay silent. But what I do know is that God says they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Whether from life's first cell till final breath, I believe that. So where do what where do stillborn children go? We believe heaven. So what happens? This little baby can't walk. Let God be God. He'll take care of him. He does a great job. Plan B. Okay? I've discussed that, so I won't go into it now. I will say this only because I don't want anybody to ever go, you didn't tell me. The birth control pill is not designed to be an abortifacient. Period. It's not. Okay? I know so there's some pro-life groups out there, individuals go, eh, yeah, yeah, drop you. Yeah, okay, it, it's not designed that way, okay? Um, in fact, less than 1%, half of 1%, actually uh, are born through this method. And they would say, well, 25%, we just saved 24.5% of those children. Well, okay, that's not how I'm debating this issue. I don't believe that at all. However, okay, what I will say in this, it's rare. 
But does it occur? Yes. Okay, why? Because these are the stages of it. What it's designed to do. It's designed to prevent ovulation. But have you ever heard of people on the pill that had a baby? That got pregnant? Uh, yeah. So it doesn't always work. The thing that, here's what I want to say. Um, that we need to have good conversations about is when girls are on the pill and they miss a day because they forget what they found, okay, it was actually through a cancer drug. This is how this was developed. But what they ended up finding out is that this is basically a supercharged pill when you I missed two days, and so I took three. And there's girls who do that. That'll help. It, what actually becomes is like a plan B. It's designed to not stop ovulation, but the implantation at the end of the uterine wall and stopping the implantation of that fertilized egg. RU486 is methipistrone. Used together with mesoprostrol. It's a synthetic steroid. It's a French abortion pill taken five to seven weeks after conception. It deprives the uh, baby of vital nutritional hormone progesterone. The child starves to death and as nutrient lining of the womb sloughs off and they deliver the dead child. Very, very tiny, very, very small. There's not very recognizable, obviously, but it's designed that way. Dilation and curatage. It, it is an abortive method of the DNC. Used in the first trimester, the dilate the cervix is to allow the insertion of a cure a loop shaped knife into the womb. It scrapes the placenta from the uterus and cuts the baby apart. Pieces are drawn through the cervix if it's the, depending on the time of the trimester. Suction and aspiration is typically used 84, 85% of the time up to the 13th week of pregnancy. Uh, the mouth of the cervix is dilated. The hollow tube with knife-like edge tip is inserted into the womb. It's a suction machine. 28 times the force of a normal household vacuum cleaner. It basically sucks the child into a glass jar. Okay? Dilation evacuation is used in the second trimester, 12 to 24 weeks. The child is, I've seen this. It, it's unbelievable. They, the child is literally cut into pieces. Um, the child is much larger, far more developed. They have to place the child back on the stand to make sure they've got everything else, and then they use the curate to, to scrape the uterine wall. Prostaglandin. This is used in the second trimester later in it. Uh, hormone is injected. Um, the suppository is, it causes the uterine to track. Basically, it's, a, it's before viability. Viability is a term you need to be aware of. It's an important term. Does someone know the definition of viability? Anyone? Yep. When the child can survive outside of the, the, the uh, mother's womb. Okay? Usually at 22, 23. I was, I was just going to say, that's the definition that people give, but people forget what infant is viable on its own. Yeah, exactly. So I, that's why now people are starting to talk about, oh, well, we can, we can kill children up to about age two if you don't want to have a child because they're not viable. They can't, they can't feed themselves, etc. That's Peter Singer primarily and his cronies. Uh, Peter Singer says that we should wait several months after birth to determine if the child has any defect, if it does, kill it. And he teaches at Princeton University in their ethics department. <laughs> True. Public health, yes. I, I don't know. I've not read that. It, we're, we're more, he's more because he was an animal rights activist in the '70s before he left the United States, and then he came back to Princeton. So he was more of an animal rights activist, and he says that a pig has more right to life than a, a mentally challenged child. Yeah. Saline injection. This is when amniotic fluid is removed from the the womb, and an injection of saline salt. It's called salting out. Is, in, is given to the child, uh, to, into the womb, and basically it burns the outside of the child's skin off, and it actually, the child is breathing in amniotic fluid, so it literally kills the lungs. It destroys the lungs because it's burning the lungs, okay? 
then they, they deliver a child. Unfortunately, though, we've had that liberty. We've had students that were aborted through this method, saline, but they survived. In many cases, they're just strangled by the doctor or put in a jar, shut the lid, but in some cases, they have a, a conscience and they actually let them live. And we've had them speak at Liberty and students have been at Liberty from this that survived. They're outside their skins have been burned, et cetera, but uh, we've got to save them. Hysterotomy is the, is, the, is the only one of the methods that's still being used today for fetal tissue research. You can't have dead tissue to research on. They don't need fetal tissue to do research. They can use uh, the uh, amniotic sac, they can use the, the uh, afterbirth, et cetera, but they, they do this for an abortion method. This is up to the day before the child's born. And basically it's a C-section abortion, that's what I put in it. They, they do a bikini cut, they go in, they cut the umbilical cord while the child's still in the womb, and then they strangle it to death. Or they pull it out, but, but once the baby's out, it's a person. So they can't, they're not legally supposed to, but they have, they've been caught. In many cases, they just put them in jars and let them suffocate to death at that point. But nevertheless, and partial birth was what President Bush, um, George W. Bush, got um, made illegal during his presidency. It was the first one decided that was going to be used, and I won't even go into that, but if you want to look at partial birth, you can. It's called the DNX abortion. So the key question then is, when does life begin? I believe that scripture tip communicates, I think that life begins at conception. Arguments from science, real quick. Many people mistakenly feel that abortion is a religious issue, but it's not. It's a scientific issue. It, it is a religious issue because we, the Bible speaks about life and the value of it. But it's a biological issue. Dr. Keith Moore, professor and chairman of the Department of Anatomy, University of Toronto said, human development is a continuous process that begins when an ovum from a female is fertilized by sperm from a male. Growth and differentiation transform the zygote, a single cell, into a multicellular adult human being. In biology and in medicine, Professor Michelin uh, Matthews Roth, um, it is an accepted fact that the life of any individual organism produced reproducing by sexual production begins at conception. Dr. McCarthy DeMere, practicing physician law professor at the University of Tennessee, the exact moment of the beginning of personhood in a human body is at the moment of conception. Raymond Gesser, beginning of individual human life from a biological perspective states every human being began his or her unique existence in this manner as one cell. Jerome Lejeune, French geneticist, testifying in Davis versus Davis, 1989, now we can say unequivocally that the question of when life begins is no longer a question of theological or philosophical dispute. It's an established scientific fact. All life, including human life, begins at the moment of conception. Okay? So the bottom line is this. There is no longer a debate about when life begins. In an animal, and PETA argues it, or with a human. It's at the moment of conception, not implantation, and, the other. and at the moment of conception, the DNA of that child is established. All it takes is now growth and differentiation. It's just time. Everything's there. Their eye color, their hair color, everything about them. Okay? Now, we understand science. There are things that take place during that time that could be that could be changed genetically or whatever, but um, it, it, if it's allowed to continue to grow, it's all there. From scripture, the unborn are known by God. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, okay? Christ was human in the womb. Oh, let's do this real quick. Will you, will you give me five minutes? Let's finish this up. I, I, we can do this. Who will look up Matthew 118? Real quick. Who will look up Matthew 118? Because I wanted to, Okay, thanks. Luke 135. Let's just do this real fast. Thank you. Um, who will look up Psalm 515? Thanks. Who will get Luke 144, 41, and 44? Thank you. Genesis 25, 22, and 23. 
Thank you. Judges 13. Two, uh, let's skip that one. Isaiah 49, 1, for time's sake. Thank you. Um, who will get, uh, I've already done that one, Luke 2, 12, and 16. Who will do that one? Thank you. All right. 2 Timothy 3, 15. Who will get that one? Thank you. Exodus 20, 13 is there, so we don't need it. Exodus 21, 22, and 23. Who will get that one? Thanks, Tim. Okay. Christ was human in the womb. Matthew 1, 18. She was found with child. Okay? Child. It's a person. Luke 135. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. See? The humanness of Christ. Psalm 51 5. The unborn possess personal characteristics such as sin. Indeed, I was guilty. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. He already, already possessed the sin nature in the womb. Okay? Luke 1, 41 and 44. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it strange to me that the mother of my Lord shall pay me? The babe leaped with joy. How does a, how does a non person experience joy? The unborn are called by God before birth. Genesis 25, 22, and 23. Who are they speaking of? Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. Okay. Isaiah 49 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Now, think about this, folks. That's not special to Isaiah. He has spoken your name. Your name. Before you were even born. Your name. God loves you. And God loves the unborn. The same Greek word. In Greek, there is no different word. Okay? The unborn and the born are used the same. We already talked about the babe leaped for joy. Okay? 2.12. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Brave us. Okay? You will find the babe. 2 Timothy 3.15. Here we have, from, from childhood, same word, the unborn and born used. Brave us. As a child, Timothy, Paul's talking to him. <laughs> and who influenced them? His mother and grandmother. When he was just, same word. <laughs> Exodus 20, 13 says, you shall not murder. It applies to the unborn. They are worth fighting for. Loving. But you know what? The nice thing about Thomas Road, we don't, we don't, Declare unrighteous, the unrighteous darkness to be wicked without lighting a candle. That's why we support the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center and the Liberty God Parent Home and places like that to help women, not condemn them. Okay, and we partner with that. I, I just earlier this summer helped a, a person get connected 
so that they could find a place in their state that they could work with for an, uh, a girl that was pregnant. The protection of the unborn. Final one, and we're out of here. Now, this is interesting. And the reason I put this last, after thou said on murder, is that this is used by pro-choice and pro-life groups. Same passage. Why? Because English translations of the Bible have messed up. Okay? They have mistranslated this. And so an accurate Hebraic translation of this is the word prematurely, not miscarriage. Who had that? Exodus 21, 22, and 23. pretty clear. Here's, here's how the liberals use this passage. They, they use English translations of this or a potential interpretation of it and they go, if two guys are fighting, basically here's, here's what's happening. Two men are being boys and they're fighting. And probably a pregnant wife, some part of her delivery, okay, later term, third trimester, she's pregnant, Okay? Stop this! Stop it! And in the midst of it, the guy swings and hits her instead. And the Bible says, and she delivers prematurely. At that point, the husband, who's the decider of that home, decides the punishment for the guy who hit his wife. Or if it's, if it's just two random guys. And a woman gets involved, which, okay, let them beat themselves to death. Okay, let them do their thing. But regardless, she got, she had the job. See, some translations say miscarriage. And a miscarriage, what happened to the baby? It dies. And see, the next sentence says, and if no harm follows. In other words, the woman doesn't die. And the husband gets this. See, do you see the problem with the translation? If the child is delivered and no harm follows, neither one of them die. It was still majorly inconvenient. This is a major problem, especially at this time. They didn't have neonatal units. Okay? The husband decides. But if greater harm followed, life for life. Okay? And I think that's the best translation is prematurely not miscarriage. That's not a pro-life position. That's a pretty close translation from Hebrew. That's the best translation of that passage. Okay? Now here's the bottom line, folks. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we love all our neighbors? Do we love our own children and grandchildren? Then are we willing to communicate, be in relationship, and walk them through this process? Giving them value and helping them to make good moral choices. But may it never be said of us that we become the excuse. You didn't love me. I just needed somebody else. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of life. Lord, may we never take it for granted, but we, may we also never be insensitive. But in our hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. May we always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within us. But may we do so with gentleness and respect. There are hundreds of thousands of babies in the United States. And there are 
millions of babies around the world being aborted every year. May we learn to become a voice to the voiceless. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all. Have a great week.